I've wanted to make a Rayman 2 related video for months now. I just haven't been exactly sure what the angle or take should be. You see, Rayman 2 was my first Rayman game. It was my introduction to the franchise. My grandmother gifted me a copy of the game for the Nintendo 64 back in late 1999 or early 2000. She said she thought it looked like something I would like and boy was she right. I still have that green working original 20 plus year old N64 cartridge. And since those days, Rayman has become one of my very favorite platforming franchises. I've been a fan ever since. And other than a super classic and influential game like Super Mario Bros. 3, let's say, I think Rayman Legends, the most recent mainline game in the franchise, is the greatest pound for pound 2D or side scrolling platformer of all time. But that game came out eight years ago, and since then the franchise has fallen dormant, with Ubisoft seemingly abandoning it in favor of Paint by Numbers open world fetch quest fests. Things have gotten really weird at Ubisoft in general, from allegations of widespread employee misconduct to the departure of Rayman creator Michel Unsell. You probably know the story, and I've also done other videos on these topics if you're interested. But back to the matter at hand, Rayman 2 played such an important role in my gaming history and shaping me as a gamer that, like I said, I wanted to produce some kind of love letter to the game, especially because I think the game has become underrated and underappreciated in recent years. It's been somewhat overshadowed, I believe, by the other landmark 3D platformers of the day, Super Mario 64, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro the Dragon, and Banjo-Kazooie. Unlike Rayman 2, the aforementioned games have all received remakes, remasters, some kind of re-release over the last six years, and even though I feel Rayman 2 has earned a place in the 1990s 3D platforming hall of fame, it's simply not as available and relevant and top of mind with today's gamers as it should be and could be. Because the game still feels great to this very day, just running around, jumping, breaking cages, shooting your power fist, it's not easy to make a quality 3D platformer as we've come to realize, and Rayman 2 definitely passes the test in my book. In addition to that minute-to-minute -minute gameplay, you have a dynamic soundtrack, memorable characters, incredible art direction. The art direction is likely the single aspect of Rayman 2 that sticks with me the most to this day. Sure, it's still a very humorous, lovingly animated game, but it's also a very dark game. The aesthetics, the color palette, the thematic depth, the dreamlike quality. This game genuinely scared and intrigued me as a kid, but we've never had another Rayman game quite like it. And despite all the versions of the game that exist, you can't digitally download it on the Xbox or PlayStation stores today. And old disc copies of the game don't run correctly on all of today's computers. Yeah, there's always emulation, but emulation will never match the cultural impact of official releases. If you don't have an old working console like an N64 or a Dreamcast, you might be out of luck. I recently replayed the game on my 3DS. That was a fine, convenient, portable way to play the game, but it's certainly not the optimal version of the game, and even that port is over a decade old now. I talk about video game preservation all the time on my channel, and I do worry about games like Rayman 2, games that feel like they're slipping away and being lost to time, or at least to the depths of eBay. Enter my friend Leon. Leon is a 3D modeler and animator who's based in Poland, and over the last year, in order to complete his university degree in these subject areas, he had to put together everything he had learned into one final thesis project. So he thought, why not recreate the intro of his favorite video game of all time, which happens to be Rayman 2. Leon actually found me and my channel some months back while he was working on his thesis project, and we got to talking about his project. He showed it to me when he was finished, he shared it on my Discord server, and so if we circle back to present day, when it came time to make a Rayman 2 video for my channel, I thought, who better to collaborate with than beyond someone from the original team at UB 
Ubisoft Montpellier, the person in my circle who best knows this game inside and outside, forward and backward. No one I know has spent more time studying and dissecting Rayman 2 than Leon, and that's why I had to invite him onto my channel for this video to discuss our shared appreciation for Rayman 2 and also to discuss in depth his truly amazing project. And I'm not just saying that to be nice. Leon's video should give any Rayman fan goosebumps. This is exactly what we dream of a Rayman 2 remake looking like. Not just a simple upscaling, but a beautifully artistic interpretation of the source material that's truthful to the original vision while being reinvigorated with modern embellishments like enhanced textures, volumetric lighting, and clever depth of field work. Leon's two minute video is available for 4K viewing on his YouTube channel right now, so any Rayman fan should go over there, check it out, and give him a sub for his amazing work. It's passionate fans like Leon who keep Rayman alive and keep the rest of us focused on the positive stuff, the great games that do exist during this tough time for the franchise. So hey there, Leon. It's a pleasure to have you joining me on my channel. Why don't we start by learning about your history with Rayman and your introduction to this game, Rayman 2. No problem. Okay, so I first saw Ray Rayman 2 uh, when my cousin was playing it. I would think I was about five years old, maybe six. Because I live in Poland now. My family is Polish. We didn't live in Poland then. And we once a year or maybe half a year went back to Poland. And most of our days I spent uh, in my grandma's house. And my cousin also lived there. And he used to play a lot of video games. He used to play Tibia. But always when I came to him, uh, he would boot up Ray Rayman 2 and he would show me all these cool levels, cool graphics. It was it was the first video game I ever saw someone playing and it was the first video game I ever played because we didn't have a computer where we lived. So uh, my first experience with video games was actually Rayman 2 because the game he had, he had it from a CD that he bought with a magazine. So he would lend me that CD. So when we finally had a computer, I could play Rayman at home. Do you see the picture? <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's me. That's, that's awesome. That's little me. We saw uh, this uh, pack of games with Rayman 2, Rayman M. I think yeah. it's Rayman Arena in the, US, in the US and Rayman 3. And I remember we bought, uh, my dad bought it for me. This is the computer I played on. A lot, a lot of fun. I remember I played it very many times. It, it's not like I played it once and then forgot about it. It was a game I would very frequently get back to. That's an awesome picture. That's so cool that you have that. <laughs> yeah. I'm so happy I found it. Yeah, yes, very proudly standing next to your pack of Rayman <laughs> games yeah, with that old school Samsung monitor. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I also remember this t-shirt. I really liked having it. <laughs> that is a cool t-shirt. I don't have it anymore. So I think Rayman is more popular in Poland than in America because Poland didn't have, uh, when Nintendo came out with the N64, there was not, not many people in Poland had it because uh, it's a long story about history, but we didn't have things that America had. So we didn't have the N64. So games like Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie, nobody knows about these games here to, still. Like the Nintendo Switch, I have it, I play it, I really like it. On, I have only two friends that know about the Switch and they're from my workplace. But my friends that I grew up with, nobody uh, owns a Switch or nobody knows games like uh, Kirby, uh, Zelda, because it's just not that popular here in Poland because it wasn't popular in the beginning. But in Poland, because we didn't have these 3D platformers, but we did have Rayman. And when I showed the animation to my friends from Poland, almost everybody knows that game. Maybe they never played it, but they do recognize the game. Oh, it's the Rayman game with the swamp levels. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. And when I show the animation to other people that I know from, not from Poland, they think, oh, cool animation. I didn't know of the game. So I think that's interesting that, but I do think Rayman 2 is underrated because when I scour the internet, there are big fandoms of games like Crash, Spyro, Mario, Zelda, all of these uh, games. Uh, and Rayman seems maybe a bit forgotten. For me, Rayman 2 is a classic. Mm -hmm. For a, a lot of people would say Mario 64 is a classic, but I wouldn't think a lot of people know of Rayman 2 as a classic game. 
It's not a long game, but it has so much diversity inside that it never gets boring. And the whole time you are playing, you, you're just having fun, as you're supposed to ha have in playing video games. After the intro sequence, there's this animation where the robots uh, throw Glowbox inside with Rayman. And because I downloaded the soundtrack of uh, the game, I put it under the original animation, so there was no dialogue, no sound effects. And it was amazing to watch that sequence when the, the robots throw Glowbox inside, because every emotion you feel is right in the song. You can feel the pirates, they are mean. You can feel in the music that the creatures inside the cages are sad and they need help. Even when they throw Glowbox inside Rayman, the music is very uh, quiet. And you can feel the sadness in the quietness of the music. And then when Glo Rayman realizes that Glowbox came with uh, the magic power from Lee, the music rises up back again and is happy. And I just think that's such amazing storytelling, just using audio and music. You don't need any language because you don't need to understand anything because the music and the things you see just portray every emotion so perfectly. I even remember when I was 12 years old, I had the Rayman 2 disc, I found the samples for the music from the game. Wow. I really liked the song, The Sanctuary of Water and Ice. Just boot that level up just to hear that, that song. And I, and I remember I got the disc, I opened the samples used in the songs, I put all these samples into an editing software, made my version of the song, and downloaded it on my MP3 so I can listen to it when I'm uh, going to the commute to school or something. So when did you know, I mean, I, I know you told me that you were pursuing this bachelor's degree in mm -hmm. animation and design, and was there a moment when you knew that you had to do Rayman 2 as your project? Well, the idea for the Rayman 2 project, like reimagining the opening sequence, uh, I had this idea even before I thought about making my bachelor project. So it was an idea that was in my head uh, for a long time. I just didn't really know how to start making it and when was the best time for me to start making it because I knew it would take a, a lot of time to finish. I didn't really have the idea yet, but I knew I had. I wanted to do something Rayman 2 related, and I knew I wanted to be like a reimagining the graphics, like a remake, like we we saw with Crash Bandicoot. They made uh, the remakes of that game, Spyro. Um, I wanted to make something like that, but not a game because I'm not a game designer. I would have no idea how to do that, but with 3D animation. So that was the thing I thought about for a long time, and I went to university where I studied uh, 3D graphics, animations, post-production. And for my bachelor project, I had to, I had to make up uh, a project to do. So I thought, wow, this is a perfect, perfect time for me to, uh, to do this big project I was thinking about for so long. So I told my teacher uh, what my idea was. He said, that's a great idea, uh, that many Rayman fans would love to see that. And he said, sure, you, you can do this. That's no problem. It was a 10 month project. The day I started, um, yeah, it took 10 months of work, almost every day. Mm -hmm. And now Leon, your two minute video, it's sort of an original sequence of scenes from the game, right? Like that exact yes. sequence does not mm -hmm. play in the original Rayman 2 yes. game. You almost created like a spin on the intro or it almost mm -hmm. kind of feels like a trailer of sorts. Yes, yes, uh, because in the beginning, I thought about making like a teaser trailer for Rayman. Like I would try to imagine if the game came out today, if they made a teaser for it or made a trailer, what would it look like? But then I thought about uh, trying to remake the introduction sequence from Rayman because that was a perfect thing I thought uh, I could do because the intro has awesome music. It has text that is in the PC version. I was using the PC version as a reference. There is no voices. There's just text on the screen. Uh, so I decided that that would be a great blueprint of some sorts to use uh, to then make my project based on that, the music that was in the intro sequence and the text that is shown on screen would be read. So the idea I had was that every, every text that we see in the intro has to show some kind of scene that correlates to what is written 
and what then later would be read out loud. So what we hear is about what we see. I had to come up with places and characters uh, from the game that would uh, that would fit the scenes. So like it's a symbiotic relationship of the audio and the video. Uh, that was also easy because uh, the narration had, I think it was 10 or 11 uh, different sentences or some kinds. So I knew that that would be about 10 or, or 11 shots. So 10, ab about 10 and 11 shots doesn't seem like much, but it's actually a lot. So I knew I had to start very early because when I started my project, a lot of I think everybody else uh, on, in my university haven't, haven't even decided what they would be making. And I was already starting on the first shot. And everybody <laughs> was, oh, Leon, you're starting so early. Well, why is that? And I just knew I, that I needed to have a lot of time to finish all of this. And I have to say, after the 10 months, because I did have a deadline, after the 10 months, I did have to scrap a bit of things. I didn't, I wasn't able to make everything I wanted to. And that's okay, because at the beginning of the project, I thought about different results of my work. So I, I pictured what the best, best result would be, the perfect animation I could make. Then I thought about animations that, uh, what would it look like if I didn't have enough time? And what would it look like if I would, had no time at all to make it? So I had these like three little goals I had, and each of these goals was one I would be proud of and it ended up to being the second one. Not the perfect, the best one I could imagine, but the one that, that is okay because I didn't have actually that many time. And the most important thing I wanted to, to do was to recreate from scratch every character that you saw in the animation. So the Robo Pirates, the Henchman, uh, Razorbeard, Rayman, and there was also the Walking Shell. The walking shell is the only character I was able to build to make from scratch, uh, to remake it. The other ones, uh, I had to cheat a little. I had to use uh, some pre-made models from the game that I was able to extract. But I used the model from the game as a base. And on that base, I remodeled them for them to have a lot more details uh, in the textures and the models. So that's it. But I really wanted to make them from the from the ground up because I wanted to put a little twist on every character so it doesn't look perfectly the same, but it still is the same character. Sure. Well, that's awesome that you did the walking shell though. The shell is so authentic. Like the way the shell moves, it's exactly like you'd think it would be in the game. So how did you yeah. pull that off? Okay, so this is the project of the shell I made. Uh, it's, as you see, it is rigged and I'm using Blender for the project. This is the 3D software that I use to make uh, this whole thing. This already has an animation, but I just wanted to show you that this character is fully rigged. So oh, as you nice. can see, uh, if I t touch the to torso, the knees bend in a natural way. And the same with uh, the feet. So when I made the animation, I was it, it looked uh, more realistic than making every joint and every part of the body move on itself. So the animation I made is of it running. Okay, yeah, so this is uh, the animation mm -hmm. I made. It's a looped animation of the shell running. I based it on watching the shell uh, in game, but in the game, the shell had very wide, uh, wide knees. It was like they came out here and then down, and that didn't look natural. Maybe they did it because that's how the engine back then could have handled it. So you can see it's looped animation of it running. And then in the final product, I just got this looped animation. And then on on two keyframes on position, I just made him run like that. Mm -hmm. And as you see, uh, there's this plane glued to the back of this shell. And this is actually a texture of the fire that comes out of the shell. I made it like that. so. When the shell runs, you can see a little animation of the fire spewing out of the back of the shell. Okay, so I can show you the the animation that is played on the plane that is glued to the to the shell. So this is the animation. It's from it's made from the textures I was able to rip from the game, and now it, the texture is glued to the back of the shell, mm -hmm. and it is animated. 
you can see the different different sprites of the animation and the texture has emission so the shell is running it has a looped animation there's this plane stuck to its rear end and it has an alpha texture so that it gives emission and it shows the background if it's there's nothing there that's so cool and i've always loved the shell because the shell has so much personality yes. it doesn't have a yeah. right it doesn't have a face it doesn't um it's not an animal it's not a person but that mm -hmm. shell for any rayman fan you know that's such a, a memorable image such a memorable character and this is another thing i wanted to talk to you about leon is your depth of field work that was probably the thing that impressed me the most in your video where you're you're focusing on the foreground and then the background, the foreground mm -hmm. and the background. You do it really cleverly mm -hmm. throughout the video. And yeah, so there's that one shot. It looks like it's at about the 45 second mark. Uh, yeah, you show the pirate really? and then you mm -hmm. change the depth of field and we see the background and we have the shell mm -hmm. running by. It's, it's a great little scene. I really, I, it's one of my favorite scenes, actually. It turned out so good. And it's cool that you mentioned the depth of field. That's why I didn't use the built-in cycles render engine that's built in Blender. I used the Octane render engine because Octane is a very fast render engine. And I knew that I had to, I will spend a lot of time rendering these things because I really wanted to make it look very good. And that just takes time to render. Because it's physically accurate, it's a non-biased render engine. So it doesn't cheat. It just looks very good and very crisp. So in the, when I do a 3D camera like this, I have every option in the camera like I would in real life. I have everything. I can make every lens I want. It, it can be anamorphic. It can be a normal lens. I can adjust the aperture, uh, the aspect of the aperture, the blades, everything. And it just looks so good in the final result. Doing the scene with the pirate, I knew that that would have to have some really good depth of field. And when the idea came to the sh for the shell to run in the background, I just think, wow, that's going to be so cool. I can do uh, the pirate first. He, he will be uh, sharp and everything else will, will be in the very nice bouquet. Then the shell comes, the cameraman, because that's how I think sometimes about the camera, sees the shell and then quickly rotates to show it and then has to adjust the focus to be on the shell, and then the pirate goes uh, out of focus. Yeah, it was a real surprise when I was watching the trailer because I, I wasn't necessarily expecting to see the shell. And then when he runs by in the background, yeah, that was a very cool moment. Yeah, I tried to, before you see the shell, I made the sound effect of the horse, of the robot horse, the shell emits. And like that would be like a tease of what's coming next. And then you, see, you hear the, the footsteps of the shell, then you see it. Yeah, the, the depth of field work, Leon, I noticed it on the pirate ship prison with the chains. Was that intentional that you sort of used the chains to play around with depth of field? Like that gave yes. you something nice to focus mm -hmm. on and then jump into the background? Mm -hmm. Yes, I looked up uh, the original model of that prison uh, and there were chains just dangling around. And I thought, wow, that's a cool idea to, to show the depth of the scene. That place is just a long corridor uh, with walls around and a bit, a few cages lying here and there. The chains give this very cool depth because some chains are very long on the whole corridor, just coming from one edge to the other. Just gives you this, this feeling of this place is big. There's very many uh, slaves inside of there. And in the original game, the chains are just a 2D texture of two, two or three hooks of the chain. So I had to remake that in 3D. So I didn't use planes for that. I, I used a real chain, but I didn't simulate it dangling. I just made it straight or just a bit curved to the top. And that was a good way of me to, uh, to shift the focus of the scene. The first thing I wanted to for people to see in that shot was the chain that is in front. That's where the focus is in the beginning. Then the focus pulls back to the person at, uh, wailing for help, and then the focus goes to the end of the corridor. And if you remember from the game, at the end of the corridor, behind the blue lasers, there's Rayman uh, sitting very sad. Yeah, I think when it comes to remakes, 
it's not just about a higher pixel count or like higher resolution. Mm -hmm. It's about those little tricks. That's mm -hmm. what can make a moving image look so good and look so interesting. So yeah. yeah, your ability to use depth of field, because that's something in games from that period of time, like Rayman 2, as good as it looked for the time, every shot's kind of flat. There really isn't that mm -hmm. depth. So yes, yes, yes. yeah, that's what really made your video pop. You really use that depth of field, I thought really mm -hmm. well. And it, like you said, it Thank makes you. those scenes come to life. You mm -hmm. can appreciate how deep they are. And and it's also cool because depth of field looks very good if there is something really bright, but small. And chains, because they are made of metal, they reflect light very intensely. So when the chain goes out of focus, there's this really nice bokeh effect on the chains. And I remember in the pirate ship scene in the corridor and in the pirate scene we were talking before, I spent a lot of time making the shader and the texture of the chain just reflect the light very well to hit the camera. And I even remember uh, in the uh, pirate scene where we see the shell, I had to put specifically a light behind the camera that only shined on that chain, so it just looks looks better when it's out of focus. Yeah, it's clear how much goes into this. Like, you have to have an understanding of animation, you have to have an understanding of textures, but you also have to think like a photographer. You have to think about yes. lighting and where the camera's placed. So yeah, it's a lot to consider. It's not just mm -hmm. one thing. Yeah, as you said, one thing is uh, to make a higher pixel count, and the other thing is to just really sit down and think about what you want to show because I went into this project thinking of this more of it being a cinematic uh, showing of the areas in the game. I didn't want it just to be, look, this looks great. I want it to be like driven by a little bit of a story. A lot of that comes from the camera movement, the lighting and the use of focus and depth of field. The thing I thought a lot when making the animation was where the eyes of the viewers are going to be. And a good example is this shot. In the beginning, you see everything is blurred except for this, uh, this sign that says, hey, watch out, Piran piranhas are here. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that the person watching the video focuses on. And also, before we see this shot, the shot before is the one outside where there is a big moon. And if you watch closely, the moon is in the same place as this sign is right now. So if the person in the shot before looked at the moon, the next shot, they are already looking at the place I wanted them to look. So this is the first thing you are looking at when you see this. Then you are watching and then you hear a piranha sound. With the edge of your eye, you see that something is moving here. And what is it? It's a piranha. And in that moment, when you hear the sound and you see with your peripheral vision that something's moving here, your eyes start to look at the right side of the scene. And then I change the focus. So what was in front is now defocused and everything else is in focus. So you can now admire the rest of the scene. I think it's easier to predict where someone's eyes will be with a still image, like a photograph, but with a yeah, moving yeah. image, it's trickier. There's a lot more mm -hmm. to consider. Especially when from shot to shot, you are showing different places and different things. You have to think about what the person is looking at at the end of the shot and then what the person is looking at in the beginning of the next shot. The scenes change, but you feel a continuity in it. Your eyes look at the things I, that are meant to be looked at and you feel this continuity. Leon, I wanted to ask you about the lighting in the video too, because I thought mm -hmm. the lighting was kind of like the depth of field. The lighting is another one of those little touches or embellishments that makes it feel modern. Like you said, mm -hmm. you referenced the Spyro trilogy and the Crash yeah. trilogy from the pirates eye to the moon. Mm -hmm. There's this very nice, soft, warm glow throughout mm -hmm. the video. Can you talk about that and just sort of, I guess like your artistic decision-making, mm -hmm. how you decided on the lighting and, and the way it would look like aesthetically. Yeah, so the lighting, when I was thinking about how to do it, Crash Bandicoot and Spyro are a bit more cartoony than uh, Rayman when I thought about it. Uh, when I thought about Rayman, the first things that came to my mind was humid air, uh, fog, and a bit more realistic looking lighting than in other games because Rayman 2 has this 
it's dark Rayman. yes it's right? dark it's dark it yeah has a, it has a grungy feeling you have a feeling that especially in the swamp levels that the the air is thick that it's it's a bit harder for you to breathe um you are sweating a little bit and that's what i wanted to achieve with the lighting i can show you a cool picture because when i talk about rendering that's not the final process of the animation. After I render an image, I put it through post-production. Uh, and for post-production, post I use Adobe After Effects. A fun fact, the all of the things that I used to make the animation, the whole folder weighs about 200 gigabytes. <laughs> but the whole Rayman game with every asset, every texture, every sound weighs only 40 megabytes. Right. And that's such a big difference. <laughs> you know. Games were so small back then. Yeah. I think you put at the end of your video how long the total render time was. And it was. Oh, yeah. It was about 300 hours, I think. Yeah. Because, that, as I said before, I used the render engine, engine that is physically based. So every frame that rendered didn't, uh, like in games, you have 60 frames per second. Every frame that I rendered took about from 10 to even 40 minutes to render one frame. And that had to be for every frame. And the animation is 25 frames per second for about two minutes. That's a lot of time. But it wasn't 300 hours from start to finish. I didn't go, okay, it's time to render. I click play and just go somewhere and it renders. Um, I rendered every shot separately. I was finishing a shot. I clicked render. I saw that, it, that the render is going. Uh, I made adjustments if I saw that something went bad, restarted the render, and just made it go again. And this is a good segue to go to post-production, because sure. every shot I rendered, the shortest shot I rendered, rendered for about 15 hours, 20 hours. That's a lot of time for your computer not to be able, for you not to be able to use your computer. I rendered on my graphics card. So my computer was hard to use if the graphics card uh, worked 100% for the render to go. So that's why I didn't render uh, the animation in, let's say, an MP4 file. I rendered it into PNG images. So if the render crashes, let's say on frame 137, I can restart the render from frame 137. And if I made an MP4 file or a .mov, if the render crashes, I just have to render all over again. And since I already rendered to PNGs, I rendered every render pass uh, separately. So I had a render of only colors. I had a render of only shadows. I have a render of only the reflections. I have the render of the depth that's in the scene. I had all of the, I had the renders of the glow you talked about that is very warm. I had all of these separate things that I then could merge back together into post-production. And then when I thought, oh, I have to change the color of this, I don't have to render it all over again. I can just change the color in one of the render passes. Oh, oh I want more reflection on this uh, place, or I want to have less reflections in this place. I can make all of these changes in post-production and don't have to wait another 20 hours for it to render all over again. Okay, so you, you can see I, I took a screenshot from the game to be able to use as a reference for making the shot. And here you can see this is the modeled the textured and the lighted version I made in 3D. And it doesn't look, I mean, it looks okay, but it doesn't look perfect. That's why this, that's because this is a render before compositing. And this is the render after I made all the compositing things. You, you can feel the atmosphere in, uh, in this place. You, you can see the shadows are harsh over here. The reflections over here are more crisp, more pronounced. And that's because uh, from this image, I could use every render pass I had to make this image. These are different render passes. They are not all of them, but they're just a few to show you um, what I use. So here you can see this is a render pass of ambient occlusion. So it's just shadows. Um, this is a pass of uh, reflections. As you can see, I can make the opacity of this layer uh, higher or lower if I want uh, more pronounced reflections or a bit dimmer reflections. This is the volumetrics pass. The lights interact with the air uh, in the render engine and make this, when you use it properly, it makes the scene look like it has air. Um, yeah, and it adds atmosphere to the Yeah, air. yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you feel that it's not sterile. 
it's mm -hmm. that's something that something's there and i really liked how it looked like uh, here you have the pass of just the colors textures here is the pass of the emission so the light from from lights from the textures and here is a render pass that has all of the, them combined so i use this as a base and i merge all of these for them to make it look like this and then from that i'm able to edit all of these uh, on their own so that i have the image that looks a lot better than what comes straight from the render engine i, I told you about volumetric lighting so yep. the light bounces around the scene like in the air this is without volumetric lighting and this is with volumetric lighting you can clearly yeah. see the difference this just this just feels better you, you just feel it looks more natural and realistic and it's just more depth it's, yeah it's just a small change but the render time rises i don't know 300 <laughs> percent when yeah. you add volumetrics the 1999 game looks much flatter by comparison yeah. given when it came out and mm -hmm. all those layers you were talking about all those rendering layers that's what adds that depth it's not just yes. depth of field mm -hmm. it's all those individual layers that create mm -hmm. a really rich deep image right yeah for the lighting it, i used lights 3d lights these are planes that emit light in the scene and also i used an hdri image an hdri image is an image a 360 image that wraps around the whole scene and it's made in a, such a way that you have to take a lot of photographs a lot of them very bright a lot of them a little bit dimmer a little bit dimmer and until you get to very dark images and when you combine all of these and make a 360 image and when you put it inside the scene the lighting from the forest that you took uh, the image in will be replicated in 3D. So you have the same lighting you had in the place you took the photos. And in two of the scenes from Rayman, the HDRI image, so the whole lighting setup for the scene is of actually of my living room inside my house <laughs> because it just looked so good. I can show you sure. uh, how the image looks like. You can see part of the image. I remember I did leave it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> it's an Easter egg that yeah, only Easter I get. Egg, like you said, yeah. yeah. And now you know, and the people that watch this video. Yeah. Well, and Leon, I think you mentioned frame rate a few minutes ago. I did want to ask you, mm -hmm. what's the final resolution and frame rate of your video? The final resolution, the original, which I worked in, so every render uh, I made is made in 1080p, which is HD, 1920 by 1080. And the frame rate is 25 frames per second. So these are the frame rates I rendered out in. And that's also uh, an advantage of use of rendering to uh, PNGs because you can change the frame rate afterwards as you, as you wish. It's not locked. Uh, you can change uh, the frame rate of the MP4, but it's better for you to change it when you're using uh, images. And the video you see on YouTube is actually in 4K. So it's uh, upscaled by me in uh, the editing software I made. It's just upscaled like I just changed the resolution for it to be higher because in every shot I added grain. I really liked how it looks like and I thought it also gives this grungy, this dark feeling and atmosphere to the video. And when I did a test upload of the video of my project with grain in Full HD, YouTube's compression just made it look like I don't know. <laughs> it just looked really bad. Like someone painted everything because you couldn't see the grain at all because of all of the, that compression. So I rendered uh, everything again in 4K resolution so that when YouTube makes the compression, it's not that harsh for the video. So if you are watching it on YouTube, I would recommend for you to watch it in 4K. It's not real 4K, but the compression in 4K is a lot less. So you can see, uh, so you can watch the video as I intended for it to look like. Sure. Yeah, and I thought that it looked like you had added film grain, but I wasn't totally sure. And yeah, the frame rate's interesting too, because a lower frame rate can make a moving image look more cinematic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, mm -hmm. yeah, that slightly lower frame rate and the grain really gives it that cinematic feel I think you were yes. going for. Yes, I was going for that. And making it 25 frames per second, it just doesn't feel like a game it feels more like a movie because every movie you watch is either 25 or 24 frames per second. So your eye is 
uh, when he, it sees that kind of frame rate, it just feels like it is more of a movie than from a game because games are typically 30 or 60 frames per second. And also, if I would decide to render in 30 or 60 frames per second, the render time wouldn't be 300 hours, but 600 hours or even more. <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. But it seems like ultimately that was a more of an artistic decision. Of yes, your yes, that was a decision from the beginning. And the grain you talked about, uh, yes, I did add it in post-production at the end, but also I had to add a bit of it because the scenes I rendered out, if you know how 3D rendering works, uh, the scene is very, very noisy in the beginning. And every render pass, render um, refinement that goes makes the image less grainy. So if you want uh, n no grain in an image, artificial grain, then the image will have to render for a lot for a long time. So I didn't have the time to make every scene render without any grain. So I had to use um, AI denoising. It's built inside Blender and it works very well. But you can you have this feeling that it just looks too smooth. It looks artificial. So every time after I use AI denoising, I then re-add the grain. But this time I don't add the grain that was from the beginning, from the render, which is artificial and it looks like computer generated. I re-add the a cinematic grain. I have this plugin in After Effects. It's actually built in. It's just called Add Grain. That's what the plugin is called. And I, um, for every scene, it's actually not the same grain. For the scenes with the rain, the grain is a bit more vertical for it to be even more of a feeling that the rain is falling. For uh, outside scenes, the grain is a little bit bigger because I have I saw that if the grain, the grain is a bit bigger, you have this feeling that the air is humid. And inside scenes, the grain is a bit smaller because for you to be able to see more details in the shadows because if you add grain the details in the shadows just gets lost a little bit so for each uh, scene i did have to make um, different grain presets that i just threw at the end of everything in post-production what i liked about your video were these artistic touches the grain mm -hmm. the depth of field the lighting it really felt like your own interpretation mm -hmm. of these yeah. scenes from rayman and that's what made it interesting that's uh, what I was actually striving for. I wanted uh, this to be my interpretation. I wanted it to be like the way I remember the game <laughs> and the way I would love to play the game and see it remade again. That's because uh, that, that's why all of these things that I tell you, these little touches, as you said, um, they come from me. I just, you can say that I made them up <laughs> in a way to repurpose them in this project for it to be the Rayman game made by me, by Leon. I've had that experience too, where um, it can go both ways. Like sometimes you have this really nice memory of a game and you go back and play it and it's like, oh, this hasn't aged so well. But then <laughs> yeah. sometimes you, you know, you remember a game fondly and you go back and play it and it's like, man, this is still, this is still a great game to this mm -hmm. day. But our memories, our nostalgia, for old games is sometimes a little rose colored. If you know what I mean, it's a little mm -hmm. optimistic. It's a little distorted. It's not always accurate. Yeah, now that you've said that, there's almost like a dreamlike quality to mm -hmm. your Rayman video where I could see it. It's like your fond memory of what those experiences mm -hmm. were like with the game yeah. when you first played it. Yes, yes. And uh, that's funny because the first thing I did in the project was just replay the game. As the first step I knew I had to do is just play the game once more. I beat it a lot of times and I thought, wow, the, cool, I, I have a good um, excuse to play it one more time. <laughs> I think you mentioned this earlier, but I'm sure you must have just spent a lot of time studying screenshots and stuff that you yeah. took. You must have yeah. just spent so much time looking at the game, just studying yeah. the game visually. Yeah, because the time I did play the game, when I knew I already had to make this project, I played it in a bit of a different way. As you said, I studied it a lot. And what I found out, it's very interesting. The people at Ubisoft that made the game back then, they knew the limits of the technology and they knew that people will have to be able to play it on their own computers, not like computers from NASA. That's why the whole game weighs only 40 megabytes because uh, discs back then, if you had a 16 gigabyte disc, you were one of the pe only people in your country that maybe had 16 gigabytes. That's a lot of memory back then. 
So a lot of things from the game is actually based on very good texturing. The models of the game are very basic. It's just planes, it's cubes, like the cage from Rayman. It's just a cube with three textures, but the texturing is done so well. The texturing has reflections, the textures have shadows, the textures have this detail that you, you just look at it and you feel that it's 3D, but it's actually just a cube. It's a, it's a bit of an illusion that they had to make. So the texturing they did was very good and the models were very basic. That's the first thing I noticed. And a lot of things I made in my project, a lot of 3D models, was just me looking at a 2D texture and trying to think, wait, I have to make this in 3D. How do I do this? Because very many things in Rayman, like windows and things like that, is it's just a 2D texture. It's a plane um, which has a texture that has very good digital painting. When I was making the project, I had to take all of the textures and some of them I was able to reuse, but I couldn't reuse them in their original form because they were 256 pixels by 256, which is, is not a big um, resolution. So I had to upscale these textures again with artificial intelligence, but a lot of the textures I had to remake from the ground up. So as you see on the left is the original texture from the game and my dog likes the texture. And on the right, you can see um, the same texture, but it's upscaled by artificial intelligence. And I use the software called Gigapixel for this. And also you can see here, these textures, because they have such a low resolution, they just look blurry and muddy. Right. And this software, if you tweak it uh, properly enough, you can see it just gets all of these like details the grain back. of the wood, yeah. Yeah, this is a good example. You can see this is painted. You can see the brush strokes. The yes. program knows somehow that this is not a picture, that it's like it's painted somehow. And that's why uh, that's cool that I was able to use that software. And some of the images. Those mostly... clouds are amazing, Leon, because yeah, in the original game, we almost didn't get to fully appreciate yeah. the images they created. And then when you upscale, yeah, and like I... that, you can see what the artists mm -hmm. were going for. And I even remember I looked at the textures for the Buccaneer. There is so much detail in every texture used in Rayman. I was, my mind was blown. There was a lot of textures that are underwater, like under a lake that you will would never see in the game. And they have all of these rock formations, all of these coral reefs. So much work went into these textures. And that's why, as you mentioned before, when you sometimes go back to a game, you see that it doesn't look as good as you remember. When I go back to Rayman, I think it still looks good. Mm -hmm. I think the game really stood the test of time. The developers knew the limitations of the hardware. They knew that they couldn't make complex geometry. So they made all of the, these complex shapes, uh, materials, right in the textures. I also had to make uh, different maps for the textures. So here you see the upscaled texture from the game used in Razorbeard's room. It's on the floor. Mm -hmm. yeah, is that uh, his carpet, his red carpet, yeah, I think? his carpet. It's yeah. funny, I have this, this is what it looks like in the game. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what it looks like what I made. And yeah. as you see, the carpet in the game is just a stretched out long texture. I knew that the developers wanted this to be a carpet leading to him and let wood under that carpet. But I think they just weren't able to do that. So I imagine that the carpet is its own part of the floor and is resting on the ground. So I made a simulation of the carpet. You can see different approaches to the simulation. Uh, I made this geometry, made it uh, interact with the ground like a cloth would. I made different, different versions of the simulation. I picked one. I applied uh, this texture to it, and then I had to make a different maps for the texture. So what you see here is a roughness map, which shows how reflective different parts of the carpet will have to be for it to look uh, realistic. As you can see, it's uh, blurry, but you can still see that this, this part is more reflective than this carpet part. Yep. And these little things add a lot. So. I did have original textures, but I still, for some of them, had to uh, make 
these different maps. And I also used this carpet map without all of these uh, splotches for it to be a bump map. So when you look at the carpet, again, you can't see it that well, but you can feel it when you watch uh, the animation. The carpet isn't perfectly flat. It has these little imperfections inside in the reflections, in the bumps, and you can just feel that it's it just makes everything more realistic because in making 3D animation, a thing I always try to look out for is everything a computer produces is perfect because it's math. The computer renders perfect lighting because uh, the math of the light is perfect. The materials, the reflections, everything will be perfect. So you really need to spend the time of making Perfect material is not perfect. As you can see, this wall here, it's not flat. It has different places of this wall reflect a bit differently. It's not flat. It has different, what can you say? Yeah, like imperfections or yeah, imperfections. almost like a, like a relief to the yeah. wall. There's like depressions and there's, yeah, for sure. It actually looks like it was built by hand and painted by hand, yeah. you know, yeah. by razor beards, uh, goons or something. Like the carpet, again, like what we were talking about earlier, it almost carries your eye right to razor beard. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then your lighting makes him more silhouetted, more shadowy. Yeah. So he's he almost looks more intimidating. Yeah, he looks him. ominous. Yes. And he's faced backwards to you. So you feel um, you don't see his face. So you don't know if he's angry. You don't know if he was waiting for you to come inside because he wants to shout at you. you. You don't know because he's looking away. As you said, it's intimidating. And this was my, this was what I wanted to do in this shot. You, you look at this picture and you think, oh man, who is he? He looks powerful. Even when he turns forwards to the camera, you don't actually see a lot of, a lot of him. His mm -hmm. eyes are glowing, but that's all. And I'm glad that you had this feeling that he is just a scary robot. You don't know what to expect from him. As I said before, very many things in the Rayman game is just a flat texture. This whole door is just a flat texture. So yeah. the thing I wanted to do was try to replicate the texture in 3D to see uh, the process of making this. And while that making that process, I realized it's not that easy to make these complicated shapes in 3D because you need to think about the topology to work, the polygons to connect with each other in a way that doesn't look unnatural. And also, when you see this logo of the Robo Pirate, it's a texture I had to remake from scratch. Because when I used the artificial intelligence to scale up the photos, it, this just does, didn't look good. And I knew it would be big on the screen, so it had to be done from scratch. I just used the original as as, as a guide. And then <clears throat> I added the lighting. As you can see over here, you can already feel the, the warm glow that you were talking about. Yep. That's where I tested out how the atmosphere would be. And as you can see, this is a good example. This is a render that is very clean without imperfections on the on the door. And here I added the imperfections. So you can see it scratches, dents, it looks more used than it did over here. Here it looks just like in a hospital or something, a new, new, newly built hospital. And here you can feel that that it's grimy. It's they don't take good care of it because they're pirates. <laughs> and slowly, I just added uh, a lot more things to this. You can also see here it's just bumpy. It's not neat. And I think that's how also this looks like. You can't see, you don't see a lot of the texture, but you can feel that it's it's not new, it's being used. Yeah. And I added uh, these things, then I added the logo over here. And then I built uh, this corridor. You can see my fake light that I used here. I changed this light to be this light and it to emit. And this is the first scene that I made. And this wow. took, a lot of time because everything you see here I remade uh, just by looking at the game. You can see every little thing is modeled in 3D. I don't see the point of just making something one-to-one -one just a bit better. Uh, my goal in recreating things is make it better or don't make it at all. Because what's, what's the point in that? When thinking of the Rayman game, that was also a thing I really wanted to do is 
not to limit myself to the things I saw from the game. That's why I, when I made the shot with the uh, heart of the world, there was nothing I could see from the game which could indicate how the heart of the world could look like or how it exploded. Uh, and so I had to just come, come up with that by myself. A challenge. Oh, that was a very good challenge for me. Yeah. And it turned out to be a great experience because it wasn't easy. I didn't uh, recreate things one to one. I put a boat inside uh, one of the shots where the machine with the goo sprays because I just, when I did it without the boat, it just looked empty there. And, and with the piranha, I just, you, I tried to put every little thing here and there. I didn't have time to make any Easter eggs or something. That was also a thing I wanted to do is to put an Easter egg here, maybe glow box in the opening <laughs> scene, uh, sitting somewhere on the beach uh, with a cocktail or something like that. <laughs> but I just didn't have time for that. <laughs> and okay. just to make the scenes rich, richer, I tried to get in the mindset of a person actually doing a remake of the game. What would they think about? They wouldn't have the limitations they had before. They could make more polygons. They could add better lighting. They could add better effects. It's not um, that I think the level design or the character to the lighting was bad in the Rayman 2 game. Remaking it, adding all these things, I just thought it looked better for me. I just wanted yeah. to show for you to feel that this is a real place, that things are happening there. Robo Pirates are searching for innocent prey, as the narrator says. Uh, there's this buccaneer, these flying ships, these uh, lums that are scattered all over. I just wanted to for the people watching to feel that it is alive and it's a breathing world with everything um, just working together. We talked about this a little bit over messaging, mm -hmm. but you know, it's a tough time to be a Rayman fan. There hasn't been a new game in eight years. I don't think we're clear on the future of Rayman. What do mm -hmm. you make of things right now with Rayman and what would you like to see happen? I would love to see a new, um, new Rayman game that goes back to 3D platforming. I would love, to, my my dream is to see um, Rayman, a 3D platformer game that starts where Rayman 2 ends, where Razorbeard flies away and he has a new plan and Rayman, uh, after uh, cheering and being happy that the world is saved, have the same enemy but he has a different plan. I don't know if that's realistic, but that's uh, my dream, to see a continuation of the story from Rayman 2. At least remake the game <laughs> or something. I mean, anything they do with Rayman, I would be happy. Because as you said, eight years without a game, the 2D platforming games were cool, but because of nostalgia and how much I played Rayman 2, I just really want another 3D platformer from Rayman. Yeah, yeah. It would be really hard to make a better 2D platformer than Legends. But it would almost be interesting because it's been so long to go back. Like, what would 3D Rayman look like mm -hmm. today? Well, I don't know, Leon. I'm convinced after seeing your video and talking to you about it that Ubisoft just needs to hire you and give you a team of a bunch of programmers and a bunch of animators and just let you do this remake. Because we, we that need That would be Rayman awesome. Remake. I would really <laughs> like that. <laughs> so be, sign me up. Wouldn't it be so amazing, though, to be able to play a full Rayman 2 game in your style or, or something mm -hmm. close to it on a Switch or PC or PS5 or that something. That would be yeah. so cool. Even with haptic feedback, just uh, think about uh, Rayman charging his, uh, yes. his shots with the uh, adaptive triggers, with the haptic feedback. Yes. That would be so cool. Yeah, yeah, or the haptic feedback maybe when you're riding the shell too. Yeah, what yeah, the that would, would feel like. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate your time, Leon. I appreciate you showing me some of this behind the scenes stuff that was really cool. And my I love plan to talk is... about this stuff. Oh yeah, I, I don't have yeah. a lot of opportunities because for some people it's boring. <laughs> it's just some nerdy things that I do on my computer. I I really like listening to you, and I just wanted to say I I really like uh, your videos and. They're very cool, in my opinion. So the style you had, like the narration, the uh, coming up with ideas of what a game could be, could become. And I wish you have a lot more subscribers because you have very big potential. And I think you're just a great channel and more people should, uh, should be able to see you. Well, I appreciate that, Leon. Thank you. 
Okay, well, that's it. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Leon and all of the insight into his process for recreating the world of Rayman 2. Be sure to go give Leon a sub over on his channel, and remember that beyond my YouTube channel here, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Discord, and on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash terrapop, where I offer multiple tiers and cool perks for my patrons, such as an exclusive exclusive newsletter, an exclusive podcast, digital art prints, and more. I'll actually be sharing my full uncut conversation with Leon as part of my Patreon podcast this month. All those links, including a link to Leon's channel, are in the description of this video. So be well, thank you for watching, I look forward to hearing your thoughts about Rayman 2 and Leon's project down in the comments, and I'll catch you next time.